Goedemorgen allemaal. Ik wacht nog even op Pyrus. Die zal uh, de lezing geven. En dan uh, wordt het, uh, gaan we beginnen. Dus ik wacht nog even op uh, Pyrus Nuria.
Uh, good morning, Pirus. Oh, you have your uh, mic still on. Uh, ah. Hi, good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, shall we start? Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yes, shall I give uh, a short introduction? Yeah, sure. Please okay, go ahead. thank you. Uh, goedemorgen allemaal. Uh, welkom bij deze lezing. Uh, Pirus Nourian, mijn collega, die gaat een lezing geven over uh, het organiseren van uh, functionaliteit. En um, het ligt een beetje in lijn met de lezingen die we eerder hebben gehad uh, tijdens de uh, opening. Uh, wat jullie op het ogenblik aan het doen zijn voor de opgave is eigenlijk een heel schematische weergave van jullie ontwerpideeën. Dus jullie proberen door middel van uh, ideeën over beweging, over uh, plek waar je naartoe beweegt, um, hoe de relaties tussen deze plekken zijn, proberen jullie schematisch nu vast te leggen. En uh, Pirus die gaat hier nog wel even wat meer over vertellen. En het is met name ook uh, heel sterk de relatie ook met uh, uh, dingen zoals wiskunde. Die uh, ook uh, hoe het, door professor uh, Sarioldus uh, zijn genoemd. Waarbij in feite eigenlijk gewoon, een, dat zul je merken zodra je in de computer komt, hebt, dat je dus ook een hele hoop um, ja, uh, relaties, uh, functionaliteiten kan vastleggen met wiskundige computers. En, um, en dat kan je helpen door uh, daar onderzoek mee te doen. Dus um, ik geef even het woord aan, uh, nu het woord aan uh, Pirus Nurian. En ik zou zeggen, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for the opportunity to present this work. Um, Just a second. Uh, I, I think I need your permission to share my screen. <clears throat> uh, you should have it now. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to give this uh, lecture about circulation and topology. Uh, last year I did, a, I made, I gave a similar lecture. Uh, about the same subject, uh, Paul told me that uh, um, the students found it useful in their design. So I tried this year to, to make it even more directly connected to your assignment. Because I also used to teach in this course, uh, I used to teach a couple of groups. And the methodology that I'm going to, to, I'm going to introduce to you is a methodology that I have experimented with at least in education since 2006. So uh, back then I was a teaching assistant in a design studio. Um, then I started with this methodology as a manual way of designing and then later on I complemented it with some computational tools. Well, uh, you might be wondering what is topology and what is topological a topological way of designing buildings. Before going into the details, I will show you some work samples from the previous years. Um, Paul, I'm, I'm not sure if you're recording this, but maybe you can record it for a second time and then uh, I can- Yeah, I'll be recording. Edit the best version. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a little bit about myself and my interest in topology or the, um, as Paul explained, uh, the relations between functional spaces in a, in a building and in space in general. Um, I have a mixed background in control engineering, which is a branch of electrical engineering and uh, design informatics and architecture, of course. And when I was studying electrical engineering, uh, we had to design circuits and circuits are obviously like networks. And I kind of used to see buildings also in networks and when i later st started studying architecture i also could see uh, networks in buildings i hope that makes sense to you so the opposite sides of the spectrum um, then later i uh, worked on a phd dissertation on graph theoretical methods for design and analysis of spatial configurations because of my main interest in graph theory i will i will give you a, a basic introduction to graph theory and topology uh, later on. And then, as I said, I started also developing some computational tools for, for um, this way of designing. Um, these two are 
tools that are available right now on the Grasshopper Forum. You might have seen them or you can find them. This one is available on my website. And by the way, I will be sharing this, this slides online. And you can follow these links if you're interested. And this is a, the newest one, which is a Python library for uh, using fields and graphs in design. There are um, couple courses nowadays that, uh, in which I um, teach these methods in depth. Um, one of them is a minor for um, the architecture faculty and in fact for the whole field of minor uh, spatial computing. Uh, yeah. Just a an, uh, an, an question from uh, one of the students is, uh, yeah. would it be possible to speak a bit louder? Louder, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit difficult to hear. I see. Is it better now? Uh, I hope it's better, so otherwise I'll have to bring another headset. Is it any better? Um, sorry, I can hear as well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, in these two courses, one of them is uh, for bachelor five or minor spatial computing in architectural design and Earthy, which is an MSc3 course in the master's program of building technology. Uh, I teach uh, generative design based on graphs and, and fields, which is um, basically a mathematical way of designing using linear algebra, geometry and topology and graph theory. And of course, by means of programming. The method that I was talking about, the method that I actually started in, um, um, teaching in 2006, uh, it, it can be also followed manually. And that's what we did in uh, the course OV3. Together with my partner, she was also uh, leading a couple of groups. And uh, the method is essentially about kind of solving the puzzle of your building in terms of the connections between all the functional spaces. So basically it's about figuring out or, or planning what should be the use, user experience in your building. Uh, corresponding to every kind of user experience, you design a sequence of visiting the space or moving through the space. I would rather uh, focus on movements and or different sorts of patterns of movements. And then while, when you put all these patterns of movement together, um, you get some kind of a metro network diagram. I, I will show you a reference image, but I, I'm sure you have all seen a metro network diagram. So this is the, the first version, which only focuses on the intended user experience. What do you want people to experience in your building? And what does it have to do with the uh, concept that you have? for your design. And then later you can um, rather easily make it out of small and simple pieces of uh, connecting spaces and of course functional spaces like these big rectangles that represent uh, spaces for stationary objects and um, people to sit and work and, and stand to, to do something. But all stationary objects, we call them from now on functional spaces. Another example, uh, as you can see, uh, this is quite an intricate web of connections, and uh, but it just doesn't happen right away that you get to such such a such an intricate design. What we aim to do is to make it simpler to to solve these kind of um, uh, puzzles and to make um, a building that not only probably looks good, but also works well, works well in terms of the logical connections between functional elements. Again, you have a list of functional spaces and you have connections between them. And I will show you some examples that uh, hopefully will convince you that this is not only limited to rectilinear shapes. So even if you're interested in non-rectilinear shapes, smooth shapes or whatever, uh, other sort of shapes, you can transform these shapes later after you have solved the puzzle. I usually use a metaphor, uh, um, the metaphor of a cat. The cat is a, is a very flexible animal. It can fit itself into a bowl. It can, it can take many interesting gestures, but at all times when it transforms its body, it remains the same cat. So that, that's, that's the idea. I will, I will show you a, a couple of smoother versions and then you will uh, perfectly see what I mean. 
But for now, take my words that you can transform these shapes into any other shape that you're interested in. But the point is here, you, you make it very simple and very straightforward to, to go about solving these kind of puzzles. Because you can imagine that making this intricate web of connections uh, will take quite some time, but it's going to be fun because you have these relatively simple elements and you can play it almost like a game and you can put these things together and figure out whether they fit with their heights and whether the stairs are correct and whether the ramps are okay and so forth. You can even take it further and make it uh, a labyrinth because uh, your, your design assignment, this is by the way the same design assignment that you still have, if I mistake not, you have to design a, um, an exhibition space in front of the Escher Museum. Of course, the Escher Museum is a source of inspiration. Escher um, was maybe one of the few artists uh, who, were, who was interested and, and knowledgeable to some extent about mathematics and topology in particular. So this is in a way also uh, a tribute to, to Escher and his work and, and by making this uh, labyrinth of uh, seemingly con uh, yeah, continuous space or yeah, actually it is a continuous space and later even transforming into other forms. This, uh, in this one, there's uh, an inspiration from Theo van der Sburg's uh, work on these rectilinear configurations, which is almost like uh, Piet Mondrian's paintings in 3D, but again, the same principle. So uh, apart from the style, uh, you have the same principle followed in all of these designs. This is uh, maybe a, a good example that shows how exactly you can start from a metro network diagram focus on a bubble diagram, which is a very old way of uh, thinking about spatial configurations, which is still valid. Then design this intricate web of connections. You can see that uh, the student here has, has rotated the building and also smoothened the building to a large extent. I, I hope you can, you can see how smooth it is. Um, she could have maybe even smoothened it more, but this is where, where she stopped and I, I think uh, it should give you the essence of what I'm talking about in terms of flexibility of shapes. And yeah, you can also make it more sophisticated as you want. This one is more, um, yeah, uh, it resembles uh, some paintings of Escher, but again, the, the, the paths and the sequences of spaces are the main elements in the design. So I hope I have given you some idea of what I'm talking about. I, with these visuals. But this is basically the single page that I'm uh, um, putting forward. It's the, the method that I was talking about, a topological design process, which starts uh, by looking at or, or composing a program of requirements, a list of functional spaces, and a table or matrix or a bubble diagram or a metro network diagram of uh, spatial relations between these elements according to your desired, uh, to the set of desired spatial experiences. What kind of sequences do you want people to follow? If you want people to follow a certain spatial sequence, of course, you have to provide some connections between the spaces for them to follow uh, the, your intended sequence. And these connections in general, are, are, I call them corridors. And you can think of them as some kind of an accordion shape space which can contract into a door when the two spaces are next to each other, which will be a corridor when the two spaces are on the same level, but far apart. And it can also become a ramp or a staircase if the two spaces are on different levels. Uh, very central to this method is a, is a notion of three layers of spaces for walking, standing, and sitting. So uh, all, uh, I consider all corridors as spaces for walking. And I consider all functional spaces as places for sitting objects and people, or stationary objects, objects that require some space to, to, um, to be put on the ground, on the floor, like desks, chairs, all kinds of tables and stands and so on. The other one, uh, which I call standing spaces, are, this, the, are the small uh, spaces in between corridors when you ha have a change of direction, when you have a door, uh, spaces at, at which people can stand to make a decision about turning right or left or, or opening a door or not opening a door. In all these cases, you have to be able to stand for a moment um, horizontally on, on, on a horizontal piece of surface. 
And these are, in fact, landing spaces in, in staircases uh, or landing spaces in front of doors. Um, they sound very uh, simple and trivial, perhaps, but they are very essential in making all these things connected properly. You will see a, a, a more literal example I will show you later. Uh, so, and then for simplicity, you can take, uh, you can, you can place all these functional spaces as rectangles and you may find rectangles boring, but uh, take my words, you can get to any shape from rectangles. So there, you're not limited in, in shapes or in styles. You can later produce any shape that you want, but when, when you make all of these spaces out of rectangles, you make your life easy and first you manage to solve the puzzle with the, the, the right slope of ramps and stairs and make sure that all the spaces with their different heights will fit together. Of course, uh, I, I um, hope that you will pay attention to different height requirements. Not every space can be like, I don't know, three meters high or something like that. Exhibition spaces, um, cozy spaces and, and living spaces, they all require different heights. And there's also environmental psychology involved. So if you have a very uh, wide space, you, you kind of need to make the ceiling higher. Otherwise, it feels like it's suffocating. And the other way around, if your space is very small and the ceiling height is very high, it, it doesn't, doesn't feel OK. So in any case, you have different height levels and you have to connect them together properly. And in the meantime, you have a limited space. Almost always your space is limited. And in this case, you know exactly uh, how it is limited. And you have to fit all of these things together while fulfilling all the functional um, requirements and, and your design intentions. Um, so this is a, a note for not forgetting uh, standing spaces. And this is all about fitting the, all spaces into the bounding box. And then the last step, which is optional, is about morphing them into a shape that is for some reason more desirable. So um, this was the manual version. This is a, a computational version from the course Spatial Computing in Architectural Design. This is uh, all done by means of programming. Starting from a bounding envelope, this is not a trivial bounding box, but a more intricate bounding envelope in which the, the, the starting point is to figure out which parts of the envelope have to be removed so that the neighbors receive enough uh, daylight. And then doing uh, spatial analysis on noise and lights further on, and then eventually fitting the bubble diagram or the metro network diagram or the network of functional spaces into the bounding envelope. And then once they're fitted into the, into the envelope, the, the corridors are formed in between them by means of shortest paths inside the, 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 the zones of space and in between them, as you can see here. And then you know that whatever the shape, you have already solved all the puzzles, uh, all the functional um, logistics puzzles. And you, you will get the intended user experience, which was all based on this bubble diagram there. The, which kind of encapsulates all of your design intentions and ideas and your concept. And then eventually, even the shape, the final shape is procedurally or parametrically generated from, from this configuration. But whatever this shape uh, is, uh, you are sure that the, the functional puzzle is solved properly inside and you have an optimal configuration. So these were only examples. I, now, I'm, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to uh, a bit of theory and also history of these things. Um, so first off, I, I would like to start from the necessity of bothering with these kind of issues. In a way, I find it uh, ironic, uh, ironically interesting that we humans probably take better care of our cars and even our robots in designing these kind of spaces like parking spaces, storages, and so on. We take care that the cars can easily turn and the cars can easily take these ramps and the ramps are standard and so on. But when it comes to uh, special configurations for people, pedestrians and so on, usually I, I see some levels, different levels of negligence in design and, and I find it really a pity because of course the, the, the same way it is important for a car to have a comfortable turn, it is even more important for a person to have a comfortable turn or a comfortable walk on a flight of stairs or especially for people with uh, um, different abilities 
uh, like people in wheelchair and so on. Um, another example, spatial and speaking of spatial ergonomics and human factors, it, this is a, probably the most famous example of the so-called kitchen triangle, which was based on uh, Lillian Gilbert's uh, time and motion studies. It's about basically uh, figuring out how easy it is to, to do a certain job repeatedly. So, well, in, in a kitchen, in a, in a certain day, at a certain moment, you are going to do a certain sequence of actions, maybe once or twice. But if you look at the entire lifetime of a kitchen, then you are probably going to do certain things a thousand times, right? So it probably makes sense more than a thousand times, I think. So um, um, it probably makes sense to think about it more carefully. It's not just a bunch of kitchen cabinets. If you go to a shop that only sells kitchen cabinets, maybe their objective number one is to sell you the cabinets, regardless how you want to put them together. But if you want to design it for yourself, then you have to really take care that the, the configuration is comfortable, right? So what, what's this comfort all about? So you, you are going to do certain things here, here, and here. Um, so when I cook, I probably go, I don't know, 10 times in between the, the, the fridge and the, the, the stove. And and so on. So you're going to do these kind of movements many, many times. So it makes sense to put them in such a way that you don't have to do many turns and that you can easily walk in between them and so forth. And in a larger scale, let's say in a, in a very large and complex building like an, uh, like an airport or a hospital, you can think about it in terms of the total travel distance based on some probabilities of going from I to J. If the probability of transportation from I to J is T, and the distance between I and J is T, and you have many of these spaces I and J, then imagine I have to uh, take, I don't know, 10 prints every day or 10 copies every day, and the copy machine or the printer is uh, in a room that is on the opposite side of the building, and then I have to walk, I don't know, um, 500 meters every, every day, every, every time I go to that room. And if I do it 10 times a day, that's five kilometers easy. If that sounds strange to you, I can um, um, tell you about a research that was done um, in the United States about nurses in hospitals walking um, between 12 to 15 kilometers a day, if I remember the numbers correctly, but in, in that order. So that can be a, it's not particularly fun to walk such long distances in buildings, especially if the building is, is to function as some kind of a factory. So you, you, you want to kind of think more carefully how you're placing these things next to each other and, and how are the paths. In an urban environment, you can probably see this even more clearly. So uh, in many cities around the world, in touristic cities, you see maps next to bus stations and touristic spaces with a circle around your place and they say, this is your reach, right? So you can, you can get there within five minutes. And unfortunately, most of them are wrong because uh, your access as a human being, as a pedestrian, is limited to the network of streets and you cannot fly like a bird does. Um, you cannot uh, assume, therefore, that your reach is like a circle. Your reach will be in a polygon like this, which is called a catchment area. That's very different from a circle and it's almost always smaller because our paths are almost always obstructed. It's rarely so that we have a very straight path here. Besides that, you will also have to navigate yourself. So at every junction, there is a possibility that you get lost, especially if you're new to the city. And so another reason uh, why we should care about these things is the idea of centrality. I will talk about it more, uh, but for now, just, just focus on the fact that uh, Many buildings, even if they're very uh, sophisticated in terms of their designs and even the, the, the use of um, um, environmental uh, uh, approaches in their design, and even if they have PV panels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if they remain empty, that's a major sustainability issue. Because, I mean, you, you know that, for instance, there are many uh, empty office building spaces in the Netherlands. Um, one of the reasons that some of them remain empty is that maybe the, the, the supply and demand don't match and that they are offering, not offering the right kind of functionality at the right place in the network. And because there's more than enough of the same functionality or that they're not located in the right location, which has to do one way or another with 
different measures or different indicators of centrality, how close certain things are to this space. So the idea that some, some building is in the middle of nowhere will probably uh, yeah, lead to a situation that the building remains kind of empty. Inside buildings, uh, you have similar issues with centrality and, and, and also the opposite of centrality, like marginality, the chance to avoid some social interactions. I mean, I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily better than the other, even though this looks colorful and uh, very nice. And this one, yeah, kind of looks sad and, uh, and uh, yeah, dull. But this is a choice. I mean, you, it's, it's for you to decide as designers what kind of um, chances of social encounter and social avoidance you want to provide for people. If I want to get something done and, and I have limited time and I don't have time to talk with people, then I would probably prefer to sit here for at least a couple of hours. And then it would be nice to have a choice to go to such a place if I want to socialize. But it's not either this or that, but it's actually crafting these uh, networks uh, in accordance with your design intentions. I will introduce these in, uh, in the context of um, a, a logical configuration in more detail. But for now, think about the fact that if you have a complex network, especially if your network is big, uh, you might look at them as random networks, but I will tell you later that most networks are not random. Anyhow, so the network looks complex, which is different from complicated. Uh, complicated is something that is difficult to understand, but complex is, is a system that is consisted of uh, many, many simple elements. And the, the structure of the network is such that you have different kinds of centralities, like centrality in terms of being connected to many people, centrality in terms of being close to many people or many spaces being in between many spaces in terms of being at the junction of shortest paths between things and being connected to important things. That's a recursive uh, definition of centrality, which is called eigenvector centrality. Anyway, I will give, I will talk about these examples later on in the context of an example. Anyhow, so long story short, uh, I think one person who said it better than any architect is Winston Churchill. He said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So this uh, phrase was very catchy to me. And then I, I gave it some thought and I was thinking, how exactly do they shape us? And that's where I found some um, um, clues and the theory of space syntax and, and other network, uh, other sorts of network studies uh, in relation to built environment. So there's this, uh, kind of interesting uh, definition in the theory of space syntax that says architecture is the art of providing the chances of encounter and avoidance or crafting a balanced uh, level of encounter and avoidance. And the idea that a certain environment affords certain behavior, for instance, these kind of spaces here afford these kind of behaviors, like chatting with friends, having lunch together, talking about a project, getting something done in a half an hour or something like that while being slightly protected from unwanted encounters. So if a couple of friends are sitting here, you not every person would feel welcome to just join the club, that sort of thing. So uh, in some buildings, you, uh, the, the basic idea is that the shape of the built environment changes our behaviors. And I honestly think that if it doesn't have any effect on our behaviors, then maybe we are in the wrong business because it, it has, it has to matter somehow. And to me, this is how it matters. Like the, the shape of the network changes the possibilities or the probabilities of uh, encounters and, and, um, and movements in space. And in that way, it, it, it shapes the, the behavior, the social behavior in, in space. In some buildings like this one, you can kind of see the, the, the shape of the network even literally. But that's not necessary. I will show you later that uh, in any building you can see networks. And I will, I will show you how this is possible. But before going there, then I have to introduce you the, the, the basic idea or, or the basic intuition behind the uh, topology. Topology is, in a way, the, the study of geometry without bothering about dimensions and angles and such things, or areas even. It's basically about the study of continuity 
uh, connectedness, closure, and dimension. Dim a dimension as in dimensionality. So imagine you are uh, going to bake a donut or a bagel, and this is a piece of dough you're working with, and then you change your mind and you uh, decide to bake it as a mug. If you want to do so, you can um, gradually transform that piece of dough <clears throat> into a mug without ever needing to make an additional hole or gluing a, another piece or yeah, um, cutting it in any way. You can just smoothly transform it from, from the dough, donut to the mug. And even if you change your mind again and you want to bake it as a donut or a bagel, you can then again transform it back to the donut. And if you have ever baked something with dough, you know what I'm talking about. It's not so easy to attach a new piece to a piece of dough because of this, uh, the high level of consistency of dough or clay. So in this case, you're looking at clay. So in, in short, we say that uh, these objects are the same from a topological point of view because they can be transformed to each other um, by means of the so-called topological transformations. These are two-directional or bidirectional continuous one-to-one -one so-called homomorphic transformations that, 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 that do not change the shape of the objects in terms of the number of holes and the connectedness, uh, closure, and so on. So this, I hope, is very intuitive to you. And um, then based on that intuition, I hope you can see uh, why we can call these objects, for instance, zero-dimensional, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, even though they're all built in a three-dimensional space. So their geometries are indeed three-dimensional. However, the space inside these objects is, in this case, two-dimensional because um, the number of dimensions is actually about the number of choices, the number of independent choices of movement directions that you have in a space. So if you are Imagine you are very, very small, or that this surface is very, very huge, and you're standing somewhere in this space. You can very easily make a two-dimensional map of your location and the city around you, around you, surrounding you. And then um, you can see that the space everywhere you are on this surface will look like a two-dimensional surface. Uh, I hope that rings a bell, and I hope you get the idea that for Many, many years, our ancestors living on the planet Earth uh, thought that the whole planet was flat because it's everywhere flat locally, at least, or almost flat, especially in the Netherlands, right? So you can get the idea of two-dimensionality from, from, from that. So it's convenient to make two-dimensional rectangular maps of the surface. Whereas if you are kind of trapped into a pipe or a tunnel, um, your choice of movement direction is limited to forward and backward. Right, so then it's it's in a sense a one-dimensional space. You can only move along one dimension, whereas on a surface you have always the choice to move in two directions. Anyhow, so how did it all start? This this interest in topology or the shape of space in terms of not not the dimensions and angles and and shapes as in geometry, but as in dough geometry, started all with this riddle in a in a beautiful city the name of uh, Kaliningrad uh, nowadays. Uh, back then it was called Konigsberg in the country that doesn't exist anymore. The country was called Prussia. The city had many famous uh, scientists and mathematicians. One of them is probably known as the, one of the biggest mathematicians of all times, um, uh, Leonard Euler. So the city had a riddle, um, which was about whether it was possible to to go to start a journey from one of the, the, the locations in the city, pass through one of the seven bridges of the city, um, um, pass through all of them, and get back to where you started your journey, and having passed through every one of those bridges only once. So for a long time, this uh, this riddle had had, had amused people and couples uh, taking romantic walks around the city. But Leonard Euler kind of um, solved this puzzle. And in a way, uh, yeah, he kind of maybe ruined the fun and uh, affected the tourism in the city. But at the same time, he kickstarted a, a whole new branch of uh, mathematical studies, uh, namely uh, two branches, actually topology and graph theory, which are basically about the study of topos. It's a Greek word for uh, which means space. 
and graphs. Uh, well, graphs are abstractions of topos or space, and hence the name topology and graph theory, as opposed to location and locus, which is the concern of geometry. So what's the, what's the basic idea and why is it so important? So Euler figured out that uh, um, the, the question whether it was possible to go from uh, somewhere to somewhere else and, uh, to, to, and take a tour to the city and pass through all bridges only once, it actually didn't have anything to do with the shape of the, the network, with the, with the shape of the streets. It only had to do with the connectivity between these chunks of land, these pieces of land connected with these bridges, as far as the, the riddle was concerned. So it didn't really matter what the shape uh, the shapes were, and so he figured, okay, let's, let's simplify them like this and then understand and you can better realize that way that you're really talking about connections between these pieces of cloth and, and these strings. Or even more simply, this whole thing is one space, so why not represent it with a node? This other piece is another one and this one is another one and so on. And so if you represent all spaces with a node, <clears throat> every space with a node and every connection with a link, then you have something that looks like uh, what we call a graph. Well, mathematically, we represent them with matrices, but that, that, that conveys the intuition, I hope. And looking at this one, it's much easier to figure out whether this is possible or not, and then you can, you can, you can try it out with a pen and paper or just some thinking, and you will realize that indeed it's not possible to, to take such a tour. Well, a similar idea also popped, uh, popped up in, uh, let's say, graphic design. Harry Beck was the, the first graphic designer who came up with the idea of representing a metro map like this one. And I think it, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea because once you are in a metro network underground, you, this is from the, the underground network of London, you really don't care about the shape, the actual shape of the tunnels under the ground. So what you care about is where do I get on um, this train and where do I get off? Where should I change? And these kind of questions, right? So you couldn't care less about the actual shape of this. If you can kind of figure out with names and some basic idea of the, the Thames River and so on and so forth, you can, you can navigate perfectly well. And in fact, you prefer to look at this one. I mean, um, I hope you, you have the same opinion, but I think this is, this is really the, uh, intuitiveness of topology that has made these kind of maps so popular all over the world. These maps are much more popular than these kind of maps. So ever since he created this, this map for, for London, these maps have been adopted ev almost everywhere in the world because of their intuitiveness, of course. Um, because the, the, information, the, the information content that you care about here is, I would say, topological. So it's all about connections rather than the shape, the actual shape of this path. And so now imagine the reverse. So if you were to design this network, this would have been easier again. So in case of your building, especially there's no significant topography or not so many features over there. So you can more easily think about these kind of connections. Well, as I said, uh, or maybe I forgot to say, uh, graph theory and topology have grown into much more general fields of study and they have been applied to many other things other than a built environment and spaces, namely social network analysis and, and many other things, in fact, in, in science and engineering. But uh, I hope this one also um, is somehow familiar to you or at least intuitive to you that you can kind of study your, your friendship networks, your collaboration networks, and so on using graphs. But more directly, related to design, I, I kind of promised you that you can see networks in all kinds of buildings. The, uh, uh, the prerequisite is that you should um, simplify them in a sense, similar to the way Euler simplified space. So you should kind of close your eyes to things such as walls and shapes and styles and decorations, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can focus more clearly on the things that really matter in terms of spatial uh, functionality, which is the shape of the floor space. So this is the, the shape of the floor space in these three buildings. So if I showed you only these plans, floor plans, you would say they're almost the same kind of building. But if we divert our attention from the shape of the building and the shape of its structure to the shape of the space, 
Then we see this one. This is probably not so clear yet. This one, this one, they kind of still look the same, but if we simplify them further the same way Euler did, we'll see that, yeah, we can actually simplify them as a network. And then you can see that this one is kind of weird in a way for a building. So it, it to me, it looks like, uh, I mean, I would, if I were to guess what kind of building it represents, I would say maybe a temple or a very hierarchical office with two buses sitting here and the two buses have a secretary the secretary has a secretary and that secretary has another secretary and there is a secretary of the secretary of the secretary and so on and so forth so you can imagine that if your room is here and you want to meet the buses then you have to get past through at least six seven gates to get to the buses and you are probably <laughs> never going to to bother so much with uh, meeting the buses and this is going to be a very very uh, strange office space in terms of, I mean, being socially awkward. And this one is kind of like a space in which everyone is for the, uh, yeah, busy for themselves. They can come and go from a common corridor and so on. And there are only a few types of movements possible in this space. Whereas in this one, you have uh, more possibilities for taking different tours within the space um, because there are loops. In neither of these two, there are loops, and in this one, there are loops. You can you can um, you can take tours that uh, that start and end at the same location. And so this one could be more interesting in terms of being a spatial configuration. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, we should probably divert our attention from the shape of walls and, and ceilings, even or the shape of buildings, to the shape of the floor spaces. That's the essence of the method that I'm talking about. Well, of course, the building structure can have an influence on this one. I mean, you can, you can think about it as a set of considerations because, for instance, if your building is masonry or, or you want to make a building that is reasonably uh, cheap or affordable in terms of the cost of its structure or sustainable, then you should consider some dimensions for these rooms and, and try to align them as much as possible for structural reasons. But in essence, that's a separate issue, right? So it's, it's mostly a set of considerations in, in, spatial, uh, in the act of spatial configuration or solving that puzzle. And this is only a two-dimensional example. In your work, you have to solve a three-dimensional example. But I, I hope this image now uh, sets everything in place. Uh, this is the, 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 the subject matter of topology, at least in your case, in your work. This is the subject matter of graph theory. This is the subject matter of geometry. So long story short, to, to encapsulate why we care about this, uh, well, I said to myself that if, if the shape of the environment changes our behavior, it should be uh, maybe in a, let's say, um, in a public or social societal building, it changes the performance of people because it changes the behavior of people. Why? Because the interactions uh, that uh, people um, have with each other has to do with the chances that they meet and they, they work together inside networks. And this is the mechanism in which, uh, through which the environment shapes or changes or influences the behaviors and performances of people and uh, especially people working inside space. Um, I told you that um, contrary to what you might think, most networks may look at the, at, uh, at the first encounter as, as if they're random. But in, in reality, in actual reality, the, most of the networks are not random or not regular. So it's, it's kind of funny that uh, most humans uh, tend to think that networks are either regular, or like grids, or like totally random, and that there's nothing in between. But as it turns out in the, net, the so-called network studies or graph theory and social network analysis, the, most of the, the real world networks such as street networks and, and social networks are a kind of a network that we call a small world network. In social networks, a small, net, a small world network is a network in which you need some uh, six or seven, you need to make some average, uh, in average seven to six to seven connections if you want to get in touch with anyone else in that same network. So imagine you are interested to, to get in touch with uh, any person, um, 
that you're um, interested to make their contact. And the kind of the magical thing is that you need to make at least six or seven connections to get to that person. In other words, you are six to seven connections away from that person of interest, be it a celebrity or a politician or whoever you're interested in. So with six to seven jumps, you can get to them. So this is, the, this is about the structure of networks in terms of being random or not. Again, um, sometimes we tend to think about extremes and that's probably helpful to think about the way you are organizing your network in terms of hierarchy or the lack of hierarchy or the flatness. Um, this is one extreme, um, which is called a clique, as in a cliquish society, a network in which all nodes are connected to every, every other node in the network like a group of friends who do everything together, they're always together, they eat together, they go to cinema together, et cetera, et cetera. Or a hierarchical network or something in between, like uh, several decision makers, but still a level of hierarchy in between them. Or a distributed network of um, yeah, independent units, which enable different kinds of social and spatial configurations. In terms of how you can construct networks or how you can sample them, networks are one of the reasons we call graph theory uh, a theory is that it's usually based on some abstractions that can be uh, very simplified versions of what you see around you in terms of sampling space and sampling uh, larger networks. Um, when it comes to sampling space, you can sample space using regular grids or irregular Grids, and then you almost always see the same kind of patterns, of course, with some sampling errors, but um, you're not limited to one shape of a network. And okay, how exactly, I mean, how technically do networks come into play? I mean, by, by shaping interactions. Uh, Piro, should yeah. we uh, have a short break? Uh, maybe an idea that we have a 10 minute break till yeah. um, yeah. Uh, 9 uh, 9.45? And then continue yeah sure and uh, because there's a lot of information that everybody can uh, just uh, let it sink in yeah and then we will uh, continue at uh, 9 45. sure yeah okay. okay thank you you're welcome okay everybody grab a cup of coffee and we will see you in uh, 10 minutes
Hallo allemaal. Um, Pyrus die zal uh, straks verder gaan. Ik zal even gewoon even, uh, even reflecterend op wat uh, hij heeft uh, verteld. Is, um, we hebben in de opening hebben we het gehad over uh, field conditions. Het feit dat je dus eigenlijk uh, een belangrijke component uh, als je aan het ontwerpen bent, is niet zozeer de, um, uh, in feite eigenlijk de vorm die je maakt, maar het is meer de functionaliteit, hoe je dat aan elkaar koppelt, hoe je door ruimtes heen beweegt. En je ziet dus ook heel mooi in, in uh, wat hier dus vertelt, is dat dat dus echt een hele aparte, uh, uh, eigenlijk een soort aparte uh, omgeving is van waar een hele hoop onderzoek naar gedaan wordt. En je ziet dus ook de invloed hoe je van beweging en van de hiërarchie, van hoe organiseer je dus die, uh, die functionaliteiten ten opzichte van elkaar. En daar heeft natuurlijk beweging mee te maken, want dat heeft te maken met welke route je aflegt om bij bepaalde punten te komen. En je ziet dat dat enorme invloed kan hebben op, uh, op, je, uh, op je ontwerp, dus op de, hoe een uh, ontwerp functioneert. Um, het lijkt misschien dan, in, 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 als je het heel abstract bekijkt, een heel mooi voorbeeld is inderdaad die, uh, die rechthoeken met die negen vlakken erin. Waar in feite eigenlijk, uh, dat het eigenlijk optisch, geometrisch bijna gelijk lijkt. Maar dat het in feite eigenlijk totaal andere gebouwen zijn. Ja, als je het echt doorrekent naar de wijze waarop die functionaliteit wordt gedefinieerd. Dus je ziet dus dat, uh, en dat leg je dus al in een schematisch, uh, schematische relatie, leg je dat vast. En daarom is het ook zo belangrijk met de opgaven die jullie nu aan het doen zijn. Is dat je dit soort um, relaties dus in feite eigenlijk ook uh, eerst schematisch vastlegt. Voordat je überhaupt over vorm begint na te denken. Dat hoe die relaties ook zijn, ook met een bubble diagram. Kijk, je zal nooit een, uh, of de meeste mensen zullen niet direct zeggen van nou, ik heb een bubbel en dat wordt mijn, uh, wordt mijn uh, uh, ik maak een halve cirkel en dat wordt mijn ruimte. Nee, die wordt helemaal vormgegeven, die wordt aan elkaar gekoppeld. Uh, er worden, uh, bepaalde afstanden worden dus dan uh, tussen ruimtes worden gedefinieerd. Dus het is een, uh, het schematische deel hiervan stelt je in staat in feite eigenlijk het ontwerp te ordenen, dus in feite eigenlijk de, de functionaliteit te ordenen, de, de werking van je gebouw eigenlijk te definiëren, voordat je überhaupt nog een wand hebt getekend. En dat maakt het zo'n krachtige hulpmiddel. En dat is ook de reden waarom we deze opgave doen. Um, Pyrus, um, I hand it over to you again. I would say, uh, take it away. Uh, you have to oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Well, thanks for the extra explanations. It was uh, very interesting for me to hear your explanations also in Dutch. So that was, uh, I learned a few extra words. Uh, back to the point. Um, maybe before continuing, I can, I can uh, mention why I bothered making this method because as a design teacher, I wanted to uh, suggest people to do something that was doable. Yeah, I, I know that this is all important and I know that the, the network structure of buildings affects people's behavior and so on. We can talk about that for hours, but that's a separate subject. Designing is a, is a difficult task in a way. I mean, designing something properly, that is. So, um, and I wanted to make it more straightforward and methodol methodological. So when you have a methodology, you know what to do. You, you don't... Uh, uh, waste time and you you go directly to the problem and uh based on my experience i can i can assure you that this really makes not only makes life easy as a designer but also helps you to guarantee uh, a certain level of quality and also helps you to explain your design so uh, later in life maybe in this course you don't have uh, uh, an angry client but when you have an angry client who has paid for the land they want to see what they're getting what kind of quality they're getting for their money, for the, for the land, for their resources. So anyhow, back to the point. Uh, the main mechanism, if you want to uh, go to the technical level, the main mechanisms in which networks really affect behavior um, are navigation mechanisms, or the fact that you have to actually navigate yourself through networks, whatever you call it. 
and the real is uh, you have to realize that uh, as i said distance in networks is never through almost never through straight lines so if you're standing here and the next point is here maybe yes a straight line but almost always your distance is determined by means of a so-called shortest path or an optimal path of some kind or an easiest path i have a i have a um, different version of shortest paths for urban networks called easiest path that's a paper I've written before and so what what are these things about um back to the architectural case I told you that I will show you a, a, a literal example of all these spaces. The walking spaces and standing spaces, I've marked them in red, and the functional spaces for now, I've removed all colors and marked them in, in gray rectangle as gray rectangles. And so you can see that making this is an approachable design task. You can, you can really do this and take your time, make sure that all these uh, height levels are okay, look at this at, at, at uh, uh, different angles and at different sections, uh, all kinds of sections, and you can get the job done properly, make sure that the puzzle is solved properly. And while of course keeping track, maybe you can put names on these and while keeping track of all the connections that you wanted to create. And then at the end, you might wonder what does it have to do with distance? So, well, I told you this is all about topology and this is the proof. So if you, if you transform this uh, slightly, you can get a smooth, um, mesh out of this and this smooth mesh can be considered as a network it can be modeled as a network and in this network you have distances shortest paths shortest paths will determine the distance from here to here your distance is through the shortest path in fact you may not realize this but uh, if you rethink the idea of distance distance is not about the length of a of just any path, it's about the length of a shortest path, which is minimal in some sense. Otherwise, there, uh, in between two points in any sort of space, there are millions or infinitely many paths to take. And if you were to give a number, say the distance between A and B is, I don't know, 100 meters, you should have one of these paths that is in some way special, being, um, for instance, being the most convenient one, the closest, uh, the shortest one, and so forth. And that's why I call it the easiest path, because the easiest path could be the a measure of uh, indicating distance between two points. So, but how, how do you actually find these distances? So do you find such distances based on uh, using algorithms? And this family of algorithms are known, uh, is known as um, uh, graph traversal algorithms. So basically they're about searching graphs and I won't go into the details. If you're interested, you can read about them further from, from these slides, you can take some clues. But basically, so with these algorithms, we can, we can uh, not only navigate people the same way, uh, for instance, a, a device like TomTom Tom or um, Google Maps can navigate people. Uh, Google Map applications can uh, navigate people through these kind of shortest path algorithms. You can also um, simulate um, or study the emergency response of buildings. You can, you can um, configure location-based services and you can even navigate robots or drones inside buildings. And yeah, as I said, you, one of the important applications is to, to study how quickly can people get out of the building in case of an emergency, for instance. So these are some of the most famous and the most important ones of these algorithms, the graph traversal algorithms that find the so-called spatial geodesics or optimal paths within space. Uh, the pictures, the IKEA style pictures that I showed you are describing these two. And these algorithms like Dijkstra algorithm, Einstein algorithm, and Feldbarsch algorithm, they find shortest paths between nodes in network. Anyway, so using these kind of uh, shortest path algorithms, you can you can uh, study the so-called centralities. These are centralities that are studied based on the easiest path. This is a slightly different algorithm that was not listed in the previous slide. This is from uh, one of our, our own papers and using a toolkit that we have developed the name of Config Urbanist. Uh, you can see that you have different kinds of centralities and there's even direction in networks. So this is a centrality, closeness centrality if you, uh, take it from always from the origins towards destinations. This is the opposite. This is the centrality of destinations. 
So as a destination, this is more central. As an origin, this is more central in that same network. So contrary to what you might think at, at the first look, uh, the central space is not always at the center. It's not about the geometrical center. It's about topological centrality. And there are different forms of centrality, such as, as I, as I mentioned before, between a centrality, which is about the number of times a certain piece of a network is part of an optimal path, an easiest path in this case. Um, so long story short, I, I will wrap it up here very quickly. The, the, the answer to the question, why bother with spatial networks and spatial configuration, I would say it's about um, putting together something that uh, a, a, an arrangement of spaces and a spatial configuration that is logical and sustainable in at least three senses, environmentally logical, functionally logical, and socially logical. But the environmental logic is more obvious in case of uh, large networks like urban networks uh, in terms of accessibility. For instance, when you are placing amenities or facilities in a network, uh, you want to make sure that everyone has a good pedestrian access to them because otherwise they might be tempted to go uh, to take their cars even for buying groceries or places. Well, the Netherlands has a, has a good infrastructure for cycling and cycling and walking are very uh, common, but in, in many countries and many places all over the world, this is a serious problem that uh, the energy and the carbon footprint uh, of transportation, uh, mode, different modes of transportation that are not based on human power. And this has a lot to do with the, with the placement and organization of uh, functional spaces within space. But in case of larger buildings, this can also lead to energy expenditures like the usage of elevators and so on. Anyhow, but uh, for buildings, in particular complex buildings such as hospitals and airports and so on, uh, buildings that have critical um, procedures and um, which are critical because of security or safety or health, like hospitals and airports, then you really have to take your time uh, figuring out and, and deciding what kind of connections should be there in the building, which one of them, uh, which ones have priorities over which other ones and so forth. And some connections should be even avoided because you want to make sure that your network uh, operates uh, securely and safely. To give you a more concrete example, this is the one I promised. So if you take these names, uh, degree centrality, closeness, and diff different sorts of centralities, and think about an imaginary airport, for instance, I would say these would be my general recommendations for placement of, for instance, shops, service areas, cafes and restaurants, because for instance, if you want to have a cafe, you need customers and they should be pedestrians. And if you place them in the, in the kind of like the short, the crossroad of shortest paths or optimal paths or easiest paths of pedestrians, then you're more likely to have customers. And if you have, uh, if you need to have an operational center, which is definitely the case, like a center for, the managing, for managing the whole space, then you want this space to be connected to all other important spaces. And that is a sense of eigenvector centrality or being, uh, the importance defined as being connected to other important things, important people or important spaces. So um, what I'm trying to say is that these different centralities and also marginalities are indicating the, the different sort of magnets for different things. So the opposite is also true. If you want to place areas that are, that are easier to secure in terms of, for instance, uh, health and, and the spread of uh, um, um, germs and bacteria and viruses and so on, then you want to place them in places that are not central. If you want peace and quiet, you want to place spaces in places that are not central. You want to place them in the blue region. So it's not about the red being okay and the blue, blue spaces not being okay. Uh, definitely not that. It's really about uh, making sure that you understand that when you are placing something somewhere, you know what kind of quality you will get. You know how many people will be passing by, you know. Um, how busy it will be and in what way busy. So for instance, these ones are known to attract random workers, people who just uh, haphazardly walk in every direction, like uh, super drunk people or tourists who don't know their ways and so on. So maybe it's a good place for catching customers for shops, waiting or looking for, a, uh, for their ways in, a, in an airport. They can also buy something. 
anyhow, so um, I hope I managed to put this uh, methodology into perspective uh, and, and um, that you can see that uh, this way you can easily put these things together, these rectangles together, form your network. And so this was a manual version. Uh, I think these, these two examples that I haven't shown you maybe uh, better explain this idea of the one-to-one the, the -one correspondence between movement patterns, your intentions behind the movement patterns, the sequences that you want people to experience within the space, and uh, the correspondence with the network, the network structure. So in this case, the student has, uh, she has designed the network exactly for that kind of experience. And you can, you can see that the, the design even expresses that. And you can see that this is a non-trivial configuration. And, and whatever the shape, I was sure that this was going to work. Another example with these arrows indicating the directions of movement. And um, take my word, these, these arrows and these uh, movement directions can be indeed directed. And maybe in, uh, there was a question in my uh, previous lecture about the adjustments to this method, for instance, because of the, the corona crisis. One of the things you, you have to consider, and I would really recommend that you consider, is directions in movement. If you go to a place like a museum, actually this weekend I was in Asia Museum, they were directing people out, not from the same door that they come in, but from a separate door because of the uh, corona uh, related measures. So it's important to consider also the direction of movement in spaces. And as you saw, the centralities could even be uh, studied in terms of uh, directed networks. And so long story short, this was all about designing with bubble diagrams, but exactly showing you how you can uh, bring a bubble diagram to life and solve your real problem. The, the real problem is how do I configure all these spaces in 3D, in a 3D bounding envelope, and for which I recommended this methodology. And so in the, the few more slides that I have to show you, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the basic idea of the computational versions of this uh, method. Um, uh, based on the toolkits that we have developed over the past few years. So this, this, is, this was the original idea. I mean, this was my kind of oldest dream for, um, um, for my PhD and for my uh, computational design activities. Uh, I could see that, yeah, I, I, at a certain point, I could see easily how I could abstract spaces into networks. It's more or less straightforward. You, it's all about abstraction and studying. So it's yeah, reasonably straightforward to convert this one into a network and decide that, okay, this is a space connected to here and this one connected to here. We can make a bubble diagram out of it. But the reverse is not so straightforward and the reverse is a design matter. And why, why is it difficult? The, the point is, uh, even from a theoretical point of view, this single graph, uh, even though there should be at least one single representation for this building as a graph, but if you take the reverse route, there is not a single building that corresponds to this graph. So if your starting point was this graph, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't exactly get to this one. You, you could get to many, many different types of buildings. And I would say that's a blessing and a curse at the same time. because It's a blessing because that, that, that shows you why architectural design is such a creative task because the single graph that you have here can correspond to infinitely many types of shapes and buildings. <clears throat> On the other hand, it also makes it difficult to, to get from this one to a building because of the, the utmost flexibility here. So in absence of other constraints such as shapes and the, the, the bound, a bounding envelope and so on, this is, this is going to be very difficult. So in fact, that methodology is to make it simpler and more straightforward to, to uh, um, design based on these networks by using these rectangular pieces. So in short, this methodology is about um, starting, uh, well, this, this always happens. So observe that in a, in a design process, this almost always happens that you start, or you have to start from a set of very abstract uh, verbal descriptions of functional requirements. People want a beautiful building, a nice building, you know, these things are very abstract, right? 
and there's a vague idea of the functionality of the building. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the semester, at the end of your, your design assignment, you have to give a very concrete geometric representation of the design, which is also known as the form, right? Question is, I mean, the question of design methodology is how, how should we go about this assignment? How, how should we do this properly, I would say? So what I'm suggesting here is that instead of playing with shapes directly from the beginning, we uh, study the function more closely and then define a configuration based on the functional requirements and desires. And that configuration I would refer to uh, metaphorically speaking as a cat. So that cat is what you are configuring here. And then once you know the configuration, you can morph that cat into any shape that is desirable or needed. And so, and in the meantime, you can also analyze your configuration, evaluate it, and synthesize it by hand or by using a computer. So these tools, the, the so-called space syntax tools or syntactic tools for generative design are actually meant for this to, to, to uh, help you draw bubble diagrams very quickly, uh, study them from different points of view, study all, uh, a, a few measures of centrality on them, and also try to come up with um, multiple uh, flow plans uh, in which you can realize those graphs. This is one attempt um, which, can, which can give you some basic ideas for, for your plan layout. But the more um, flexible version is the manual version. Um, let me see, these are some images. So basically, once you have your graph represented as a bubble diagram, you can easily study the centralities. Uh, just by pushing a few buttons, you can see whether centralities are corresponding to your intentions uh, for design. Most importantly, two types of centralities, closeness centrality and betweenness centrality, or integration and choice in the terminology of space syntax, which I introduced you before. Being close to many spaces or being in between many spaces, in short. Let, to give you an idea, um, we, we took this um, hypothetical design assignment of designing a, a, a regional management office, more or less with the same, uh, well, actually with the exact same um, uh, list of functional spaces. But then we thought maybe we can study the effect of hierarchy in the organization. So we assumed for the first one that the manager in charge uh, uh, really uh, loves the idea of hierarchy and wants to be a very influential um, manager. So we designed it in a more or less hierarchical fashion. And then for, for the other one, for the other alternative, we took a more flat approach to the design of uh, the network. And then at the end, we studied, um, we wanted to say which one actually works better. And we also tried to fit them into the bounding volumes of the flow plan. And then interestingly, the, uh, if you look at only this one, the eigenvector centrality, if you remember, was about the idea of influence or the notion of influence in network. So interestingly, the uh, so-called hierarchical network uh, provided for less influence, less potential for influence for the office of the manager uh, compared to the other one, compared to the flat organization. Yeah. So, or something around that idea. So then we could see how the, the network structure, which looks like a mishmash of lines and points at the first look, can actually influence behavior. Here, you can see it mathematically, and then you can, you can compare them with your intentions, make sure that the place that has ended up being the most central is a place that needs to be that central, or the places that have ended up being very marginal, like this private office, have to be so marginal and private. And in this case, this kind of makes sense. And sometimes you, you see anomalies, and then you can correct them if your design is represented as a network or as a bubble diagram. And you can literally look at them from different points of views. In this case, this is the example that I promised to show you, which is about uh, flexibility of design and, and uh, uh, morphing your design to smooth shapes. Uh, there was uh, another reason why the sequences mattered so much. This was, a in, this was an indoor ski dome. 
And um, if you if you have ever visited these uh, spaces or or know about them, you know that that the indoor ski dome can have a temperature like I don't know minus ten degrees centigrade or something like that, and the outside temperature could be uh, I don't know like thirty degrees centigrade, and it is very dangerous even uh, for health reasons to go immediately from such a cold space to a, a very warm space. It will also waste a lot, of, a lot of energy if you have a direct door between such spaces. So long story short, you need to have a, uh, a smooth transitional sequence of spaces from the coldest one to the hottest one. And at the same time, uh, they, the, 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 the group uh, wanted to make sure that uh, uh, the sequences are logical in terms of the chances of um, the businesses, smaller businesses and offices surviving and functioning properly. So they studied uh, centralities and, and uh, sequences, and they studied a network. Actually, uh, Rosna, who was back then a student, and she's now a PhD in such a lot of faculty, was doing this uh, great job, um, followed this methodology and made this uh, intricate web of connections in between all of these spaces according to the well-studied uh, network diagram. So what you see here exactly corresponds to that network diagram. So they were sure that this was the right network because they could edit it a few times very easily just by changing some lines. And then this one, this, this was quite a puzzle also to solve and this one was solved. And then the, the whole thing was supposed to be morphed into this shape because it had to be in between these other spaces and for structural reasons that that was supposed to be the shape of the building. And then at the end, uh, we could deform or form and morph this space into um, this other space, which is very curvy and smooth, as you can see here in this building. And I can tell you that, I mean, frankly, this would have been a mission impossible to directly design it would have been a mission impossible to directly design such an intricate web of connections here um, had she not made this, uh, had she not solved this puzzle before in the form of these uh, rectangular pieces connected together. This is very straightforward and easy. And then this is the, uh, the promise realized that indeed you can transform it to any shape that you desire while being sure that everything still makes sense and everything still corresponds to your intentions and you can explain it and justify it. This is even a, a more fluid version, which is based on uh, the idea of using fields around networks. And by using fields, you can get to any shape so that the limit is only the limits of your imagination. You can um, make these halos and, and use uh, fields to create these halos around networks. And, freely design uh, corridors and spaces um, and their shapes in terms of their, their boundaries. So instead of drawing them by hand, you can get them as um, layers within these fields as isosurfaces. This is a longer story, so I just uh, leave it here. And um, as I said, the, the references to these uh, toolkits are, and papers explaining them are at the end of these slides, and I will share the slides. Thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions, by the way. Uh, thank you, Pilos. Uh, I think in the chat there are uh, a few questions from um, uh, Justin, Lance, and uh, Ahmed. Uh, can you take a look? Yeah, sure. So the first one is, yeah, Justin, OK. What GH component plugin is used to measure the shortest distance in a space? In a spatial distance network. Okay, uh, in those slides that, um, sorry, uh, I have to take this thing. In those slides that I showed the uh, shortest distance and, and network distance, in fact, that's another name. I was using uh, our own plugin, it's called Config Urbanist or Cheetah for Grasshopper. Um, the, uh, there's another kind of shortest path or shortest distance, which is only graph theoretical distance for which you can use uh, the other toolkit syntactic, um, um, syntactic or space syntax for Grasshopper. That's also available for Grasshopper. There are also um, other plugins for Grasshopper that I haven't used in this case because I was uh, um, testing my own plugins. Uh, 
Um, but there's also a simple component called shortest path, which only works on networks that are based on curves for Grasshopper. Um, but back to your question, I hope I answered it well. They, these are based on using the two plugins that I introduced at the beginning. Cheetah or configure when it's for Grasshopper and space syntax or syntax is for Grasshopper. Next question. <clears throat> is there a, a good plugin for spatial programmatic optimization? Okay, that's actually a, a good question, but also a difficult question. Because if you're talking about optimizing the program of requirement itself, um, there's not a plugin or a, a toolkit for that yet. We are working on a paper uh, um, at least for one year now for actually uh, optimizing or figuring out what is the optimal network for an organization based on the patterns of movement. But that's a longer story. So for now, the short answer is, um, this is a valid question. This is an important question. How do we make sure that we have the right program of requirement and we have the right connections within that program of requirement? However, my answer, the, the short and pragmatic answer uh, without bothering you with details, is that for the time being, uh, meaning without computational tools, we don't need to think about it as an optimization problem. You can think about it as a uh, um, matter of matching your um, ideas and intentions to a network diagram as a metro network diagram. So if you can consider different user groups, uh, corresponding to each user group, you can consider a sequence. So maybe I can uh, highlight this one again. Maybe I showed it in the first example, actually. So this is what I usually recommend, that, that you have different user groups. And for each user group, you, you consider a different sequence or a different pattern of movement as to which you design one you know, set of paths of one set of connections in your network, you can even color them like a metro network diagram with different colors. Then you remember that we, I have these connections provided because of these kind of user experiences, because of these kind of sequences, especially for instance, in museums, that, that's a perfect uh, uh, case for this kind of design. And you have another set of connections and it is very likely that they meet at certain points because uh, you are going to have some spaces that are shared in between all of these sequences and user experiences, and then there they connect. So these are like junctions in metro networks, right? So you form your network, and it's more of an intuitive manual task. Once you have your network, then you can analyze it with our tools, for instance, space syntax tool. Make sure that your network uh, corresponds directly to your ideas, and if not, you can adjust it slightly just by drawing a bunch of points and lines in between them, you, you have your network as a graph represented and you get to uh, study it mathematically. But for the design of the network itself, this is, a, this is an intuitive process on, on paper. And you, know, um, uh, you, you might find it funny, but uh, as a computational design teacher, I can recommend that you, you draw a lot of things on paper first or not abandon pen and paper completely, but also try to uh, match your paper drawings with your computational drawings. Um, because on paper, you can easily think and, and represent. And of course, after this course, you will be much faster in, in drawing your ideas and representing your ideas. That, that's the essence of this course. And you can work as easily as you can work with paper with computers. So that, that's, that's the promise of this course as well. But there's nothing wrong with designing this manually, as long as you can justify and explain it. Um, and the, the other question is, how do these calculations design take into account the, the fact that people are less tempted to take routes with stairs and ramps? Yes, uh, a <laughs> very good question. Um, uh, if you notice somewhere I showed, uh, maybe I can go back to it. Um, different centralities with directions. You see here, uh, I'm talking about closeness from nodes and to nodes, right? 
in fact, one of the reasons I developed this algorithm easiest path was that I realized that people, especially when on a bike, they really care about slopes, right? But also people in buildings. So if I have to always walk towards, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a very sportive person, so I, I really don't like taking stairs. <laughs> so especially if I have to walk to a certain office, like, I don't know, 10 times a day, I would prefer that the other office is also located on the same floor. And this is, in fact, because of our physical abilities. I mean, I also have a colleague. She's very interested in taking longer walks in buildings. And she's always asking me the opposite question. How do we make a building in such a way that forces people to walk more for their health? So but, uh, I'm, I'm not such a big fan of that idea, but it's possible. But in any case, it has to do with slope, right? So and that's why in, easiest, in the easiest path algorithm, the paths from here to here actually ends up being more convenient than the opposite path from here to there, which is obviously true. I mean, if going downhill is easier than going uphill, right? For pedestrians, for cyclists, and so on. Therefore, the centrality is also different. From nodes is uh, central. Closeness from nodes means um, um, closeness of these nodes as, as origin points, whereas the other one is closeness of these points as being destination points. So direction matters, and the algorithm that can help you do that is the easiest path algorithm, which is implemented in our toolkit, Cheetah or Configure when it's for Grasshopper. Uh, I hope I managed to answer that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And the last one is, is it wrong based on your theory to start from the form and giving the spaces later in the function? Okay, I wouldn't say it's wrong, but um, if um, I think it's my duty to share my experience as a as a designer and as a design teacher that that way you only make your life very very difficult because and sometimes you you cannot easily get to a satisfactory result because um, th think about this analogy in, in a city the most enduring elements that last for hundreds of years are streets and they're also going to be the most difficult ones to change and not only because they also have pipes and cables underneath them but also because they're public spaces and everyone depends on them you cannot easily close a street off because many people's um, access will be cut off and so for many reasons uh, the streets are in cities are going to be the the most difficult things to change and if you have ever experienced any 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 renovation task you also know that uh, uh, changing doors and changing corridors is almost a mission impossible and it's going to be a very costly operation so um, as a if i may offer a piece of advice i would definitely prefer to start from um, making sure that corridors and the whole spatial configuration makes sense and then go to the details. But honestly, uh, I've been in your shoes before. Uh, when I started uh, architecture after electrical engineering, I was very much interested in crafts and design and, and sculpting even carpentry. I, I, I love carpentry. I did a lot of carpentry. And so I couldn't help but think about all details and even door handles and materials and all that, right? But over the years, I learned to to be a little bit more patient because you know it, it's it's really about patience in, in a way because you need to trust yourself that you can definitely get to that point where you get to choose the, the nicest materials the nicest details and so on but they certainly can wait until the uh, end of your design process um, and there's I mean in a way, theoretically, there's nothing wrong with deciding you about your door handles at the beginning, but actually placing those doors somewhere just because you want to have a beautiful door, that's going to make everything difficult because you have to do a lot of adjustments afterwards. And adjusting a bunch of rectangles connected to each other is very, very straightforward and easy. But adjusting doors and windows and all walls in between them and the structure and everything else that depends on them that's going to be very, very difficult. So it's a matter of convenience. And at the same time, it's also about having a logical um, 
paths forward from the most abstract things that uh, are yeah difficult to change afterwards and also more important in a way uh, especially because they're very difficult to change so if your your kitchen is located in the wrong spot in your building and it's not going to get the wrong uh, the, the right kind of light and so on you can you cannot easily do anything about this. I mean, you cannot easily correct that mistake, right? So the more important decision, uh, more impor much more important than the cabinet doors and all those material details that you like and you love, uh, is first to decide on the right location for the kitchen. Make sure that the kitchen has a good access to, I don't know, to, to for instance, to the entrance because you're going to uh, have very limited time for doing your shopping. You have very heavy, heavy hands with a lot of things. You want to take them to the kitchen and you're going to do this a hundred or hundreds or thousands of times in your life. And so it makes sense to think about that much more carefully at the beginning. I, would say. I hope I managed to answer the questions properly. Thank you, uh, Pirush. Um, I just had a question. I already uh, typed the answer in in, uh, in chat, but um, there was a question about: um, Is it possible to have multiple uh, entrances to the uh, to the garden? Mm. Uh, that's possible uh, because uh, indeed, as also Peter explained, is that you can have multiple uses. Um, so that means that uh, you might want to differentiate your entrances. Uh, mm. Say, for example, if you have uh, people who are uh, older and want to move quickly to the um, to the um, uh, to the museum itself. Um, that might be a different group than uh, younger people or people with uh, kids, for example. Um, uh, they have a completely different way how to approach um, these kind of spaces. So that is possible um, as long as you stay in the green zone. And the green zone, I mean the U-shaped green uh, shape at the bottom. Uh, the reason why we have that U-shaped green uh, part is um, that the uh, if you place the entrance higher, then actually you start cutting the uh, the garden into two parts. So you are so close already to the entrance that the chance that you actually will go in the garden is way less. So um, of course you can always deviate from the original plan if you have a good argument, but uh, you really have to have a really good argument if you want to place your entrance there. Um, uh, the other thing is is that uh, for the entrance into the um, into the building itself, so the facade where you actually entrance it at the level of the um, um, sculpture garden, there is actually no fixed point where you have to enter, uh, and also no fixed point where you have to exit. So you can decide it for yourself. Um, the question of which uh, do we have to think about uh, an exit? Uh, yes. Uh, because you get uh, into building, but of course you also have to get out. So uh, you also have to think about these uh, these routes. Is it then the same way how you can do that, or uh, that you go to the garden again, or do you have a shortcut that you uh, actually already have seen the garden, and then at the end you actually directly move once you have been in the museum, directly move uh, to the uh, square level of the Lange Voorhout. Uh, maybe, maybe I can add a small thing to that. Yep. Uh, I think uh, there was a question in the previous uh, time I, I gave this lecture about Corona related measures. Um, for, for the most of this period, I've, I've managed to stay inside. But uh, the few places that I went to, like museums and, and shops, they, um, I, I saw an interesting uh, um, phenomenon that many shops actually have decided to separate their exits from their entrances. And in the past, everyone used to think that they're the same thing, right? I mean, to save space. But now we can easily see that we don't really afford to save so much space for, for, these, uh, for these entrances and exits and all kinds of connective spaces, like the whole circulation uh, space in, in short. Because, I mean, this is not only about squeezing some functional spaces in. We have safety issues, we have health issues. Uh, I have read somewhere that uh, there was a research in Britain that showed that door handles are one of the dirtiest objects in our surrounding environments because people come and go through the same door and in all kinds of directions and they have to 
well, heavily uh, uh, turn the door in one direction and that, that really makes them touch the door and that means that they have probably not washed their hands properly or their hands are a little bit wet and that, that uh, unfortunately helps many germs to grow on, on these kind of spots, right? So for, and also the, the fact that you don't want people to encounter face to face because of these Corona regulations, you want to, them to have a separate exit from a, an entrance. And also you can see in uh, public spaces, especially places like amphitheaters, like uh, movie theaters, music halls and so on, the kind of places to which people go uh, like gradually, they, they go and take their seats in peace and quiet very slowly but if something happens if anything wrong happens there and emergency occurs then everyone wants to everyone wants to evacuate the building at the same time so you really need to have a, a considerably sized uh, circulation space and separate exit exit routes right so you you don't always afford to ignore the exit routes and exit doors right so it's, it's a good exercise, I would say. I, I really like the challenge that uh, Paul has set for this course, this uh, design in a very inspiring environment and with a lot of requirements, but uh, he's not only doing this to make your life difficult, but to actually teach you something that, uh, that will be very, very useful in your careers afterwards, okay? Okay, um, thank you, uh, Peters, for this uh, lecture. Um, it really nicely fits with the uh, with also the previous lecture about how to organize it in, in, in keep it uh, um, uh, schematic in the beginning of your design process. It's also first with the question of uh, what will happen when I start first with my geometry. As ex Peter already explains, is that um, theoretically that's possible, of course, but it will take uh, a lot of effort to actually make adjustments, and there is actually the key problem. So you can imagine that if you have a schematic, uh, schematic, it's easier to adjust than if you have a full building with all the floor plans in it uh, to make it suitable. So um, that's also one of the reasons why you always go from a certain kind of detail level. Um, also keep in mind, and it's always a bit tricky, I was uh, warn the students for this, is, um, and also with, uh, for example, graduate students, is uh, in the masters, is um, creating cool shapes and cool buildings in, in the computer. Uh, you can do this very, very fast. Uh, it is not, not that difficult. Once you know how to model a bit, uh, you can make the ex most cool uh, designs. But the biggest problem will always be, even if you have a very cool design, very complex design, does it still function as a building? So is that shape, is that actually, um, in line with the with the function of the building yeah, and the multiple functionalities within it uh, or is it purely a shape and the functionality is forced in um, on the so uh, then the building becomes more a sculpture and uh, the the functional properties of the building actually will dictate uh, also how the building will be used so if you have a very good uh, functional um, organization within a, a very cool, complex building, uh, the probability will be that it actually will be uh, used longer than if you have a very cool building, even if it looks cool, uh, but the function uh, actually doesn't work there. Yeah, the different kind of functionalities are not well connected and these kind of things. Because how cool it looks, at a certain point, people will start getting annoyed by the fact that they Spiros, for example, uh, mentioned that you have an example that you have to uh, walk half a kilometer to get a uh, copy uh, uh, from, your, uh, from your email printed out. Yeah, that is uh, fun for the first time to see the building. And the third time it becomes, uh, as you say, well, uh, yeah, still cool building. And after five times, uh, you will start getting annoyed. Then after 10 times, you probably will uh, try to find other work. So, you have to be aware of this. So keep in mind, you always build for people. Yeah, whatever shape you, uh, you make. And trust me, uh, making cool shapes is totally not a problem in the computer. Uh, I can show you techniques and, uh, which, which uh, and I probably also will show you. There are already, already are some examples already in the, uh, on the manual uh, where you see these complex uh, designs, uh, which looks quite organic complex. 
but all these designs were actually made in less than 30 minutes. So even the uh, character which you see in uh, in the Toypedia with the uh, the wooden structure where the character is looking out, that is something which we made in 20 minutes. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, making complex shape, making cool shape, is a question of technique which you have to uh, which you have to have, and that's something different than um, than designing a space, yeah, the functionality of the space. It's the same thing. Uh, trust me, you will be after this course. You should be able to make very cool designs. Uh, but for now, we really also want to make that you not only have a formal cool design, but it also that the formal cool design also will function correctly. I think that's the main thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you uh, again, Pyrus, uh, for the great uh, lecture. Um, thank you all for your attention. Um, this uh, lecture is recorded. We will place it on the download uh, part of the content page of the Brightspace. So you can, if you have any questions or if you want to look up the links, uh, you can look at this, uh, this recording. So um, thank you again and um, okay. see you next week. Uh, wish you and all the best with the course. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Hey, bye thank everybody. You. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks.